hard schedule. And our guest, Aslı Odman, uh, she had something to do. She has uh, to leave early. So there's this slight change. We will start with Aslı Odman's paper first, and which will be followed by Osman Suner's talk. Uh, I'm going to be very brief about their research, uh, but let me introduce us the first, uh, and it's very, very difficult to sum summarize her research interests because she worked on several issues from several disciplines, but let me, you know, try to do my best. She studied economics and political science at the University of Vienna. Uh, she also completed her master's degree at the same university. Uh, she <laughs> visited Mexico for a brief archival work. And uh, she completed her PhD at the Atatürk Institute for Modern Turkish History at Bosphorus University. Currently, she is working at the Department for Urban and Regional Planning at Mimar Sinan University. Aslı uh, has been giving several talks and she has been writing on uh, several topics such as industrial heritage and the city, geography of labor and capital, precarious working conditions and workers' health and safety. I'm sure that she, you, you know, uh, read about her work about Tuzla, Tuzla workers, and she also writes and talks a lot about private universities. And today, uh, her uh, talk title is Archiving in Debris, Archives as Debris, Reception History of Walter Benjamin in Turkey. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and thank you every for this last presentation. I still have a huge problem of really uh, having this abstract framework, uh, archives, remembering, and Benjamin methods of perception and image, and combining with, with uh, in front of such a prominent audience who have really dedicated their lives to constructing archives and especially film archives. So I think it would be really left to the um, to the discussion part because several things I heard for the first time myself today. And I didn't have the time to participate in yesterday's projection of the images of the Ottoman and the early Republican history. Uh, and, but I was very pleased to hear that the culture, Minister of Culture has, uh, for the first time, uh, is envisaging to make an open source out of the, uh, those archives, uh, versatile archives of the Ottoman and the uh, and during the Republican period, we all know that we have, with the lack of archives, all the historians in Turkey know we have with lack of archives, but also at the same time, uh, we have with, uh, as Rufat Bali uh, wrote, this is the title of his book, Türkiye'de Arşiv bir, bir talan ve yağma hikayesi, bir kat kıyım ve yağma hikayesi, pardon, it's uh, archives in Turkey, a history of massacre, and pillage, looting. So, uh, so I think we're going to also discuss all types of archives. Uh, do we have a lack of archives? Uh, what does the uh, well, comparatively low level of uh, cubic meters of volume of archives in, in Turkey mean? At the same time, we have a uh, archive, the Atimun archives, which is important for human history. So I hope we're going to be able to discuss this uh, uh, rather in the debate part. Uh, covering different uh, archives, not only filmic archives, also thinking about the now, it comes at, at the very end, uh, thinking about the ontology of archives as well. We talk a little bit about epistemology, how, why archives are constructed, who uses them, how can we use them, but I think my part will be more on ontology of archives, of the existing archives, what is named as an archive, and I will take, I will present you from a former work, I prepared uh, a couple of years ago where we did a comparative work in Berlin, in the Academy for Fine Arts of, of uh, Berlin. Uh, it was about the reception history of Benjamin uh, all over the world. I learned a lot from the reception history of this uh, very interesting thinker of the 19th and 20th century. I learned a lot by comparing the reception history of, of Benjamin in Turkish with Portuguese, with Brazilian, with, with Spanish, with, with, Spanish, with uh, English, British English, American English. So through the story of Benjamin, who he moved through different languages and cultures, 
Uh, I ask myself questions about the recent political and economic history of Turkey. This is a, I, I'm going to present you a part of this. Uh, Benjamin, as the man who uh, talked a lot about the linear historiography and other ways of presenting historiography about material and narrating the material. I think it makes sense talking about why and how uh, Benjamin was received in Turkey. Uh, opens us ways to question how we can encounter this archival fever or the fever of, of the, uh, increased interest in history uh, and historiography in Turkey. So I named my presentation Archiving as in Debris, Archives as Debris. Um, and our panel with, uh, with my colleague is called Archives and Remembering Berlin, or we could also put it as Benjamin and Remembering with the Archives. I think I would rather opt for the second one, or I could only prepare something for the second version. So uh, I don't know whether it was deliberately done like this, we are in um, a session now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, let's start with the So really, Benjamin is, um, is known in the Turkish language, uh, mostly in academic circles, with his work, Arcades Project, or the Passagenwerke. Uh, but it is not known to the Turkish uh, on the Turkish reading audience, since what is published as arcades, uh, the uh, work uh, is only an um, impressionistic selection of some text that the editor wanted to put together. Uh, so I don't think that is, uh, to put it in one sentence, why he strolled uh, through the passages between 1927 and 1940 in Paris in the arcades is uh, not for its own sake. Uh, but also to understand the promises that the 19th century capitalism gave with this iron and steel works. So he saw the pas passages as we do, we can now do to, uh, with the Aurupa passage, as debris, as the phantasmagoria of capitalism with the promises that were given at the end of the 19th century, with the pump of the 19th century, but the promises that were not resolved. So in the now time, you would see both construction and destruction, both concrete, objective iron and steel, and words and promises, very symbolic things. So I think this shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, the archives were objects of the urban, uh, concrete urban heritage that can be seen as debris, but also as archives. But archives not only as glorious depiction of what happened uh, by a great man, uh, what, will, what was made by a great man in the 19th century, but also as debris, as non restored promises. Uh, and this is uh, something that caught my attention when we started that uh, working group in Berlin. Uh, the magnets for sale. At the, I think Mesele bookstore doesn't exist anymore. So I was strolling through myself uh, compared to what I usually do. In Johangir, I don't have, usually this is my, this is how I go from home to work. I, I usually rush but, rush, but that day I was uh, strolling through and I saw Benjamin in the middle of that. These are magnates for uh, refrigerators, you know. I'm sure you have several of them. And you can choose among Walter Benjamin, you can have, but you can also have Che Guevara, you can have uh, uh, also, what do I, I can't see very well, I, I had prepared another one, Ahmed Kaya is there, these are more, I, I had another one where you had, you saw more historical figures, now you have figures from the cinema, pop stars, uh, you have also Eric Hobsbawm, uh, Javier Bardem, uh, Audrey Hepburn, Sevda Farda, Ken Loach, so at the other part, you can also see uh, Frida Kahlo and so forth. So he is really frozen into uh, into these uh, also magnates. You know, you, you put it on an object of consumption that everybody has in his house. Uh, so it becomes an adjacent to that uh, object. He's just frozen into these those images. So you can uh, really uh, there are also some historical photographs from you know Jihangir winter in Jihangir. So by force of very, the very rapid urban transformation of Istanbul, the year they were put, in the same year they become uh, historical objects because the 
streetscapes in Istanbul change so rapidly. So what does it show that he has become so uh, popular? So it's not a Turkish phenomenon, not only a Turkish phenomenon. Benjamin is discovered as an archival value in global academia and not only in Turkey. And I would argue that that's becoming uh, a la mode. And he would lo have loved to analyze his own situation for Turkey, I would say, becoming a la mode, uh, has entered the Turkish academia through a uh, North Atlantic trade, <laughs> academic trade. So it is, uh, but I think it's that, that uh, conjuncture, that period is, uh, opens other ways, opens other doors to, to experiment with meters of Benjamin. And I think he is more relevant than ever for what we are going through in Turkey uh, and for uh, what we need, that urgent need to keep archives. He's very relevant, we learn a lot from him. But also, uh, we should always cope with him being, uh, having uh, known him in this conjuncture of becoming a la mode. So we are not really, after 1970s, we are in a, in a period that he was remembered, you know, that archives were made in his name. Um, and uh, he has become um, a name for rapid citation and consumption as well. So let's go very briefly into the materiality of reception. I want uh, I will try to give you a very small summary of uh, of the waves and whys of the reception uh, of Benjamin in Turkey. That's the materiality. Uh, there is a prelude to reception, I say, and I think it's important. Um, there is a correspondence between o Awabach and Benjamin. Uh, Awabach was mentioned in the previous presentation by Nurchin. Uh, he was always sucked, as you said, sucked in the archives of Fuchs. Fuchs, his, his name is Fuchs, no? Uh, so Awabach, uh, again, someone who had to flee Germany uh, because of the authoritarian regime. Uh, it's a very similar point, uh, period like. Today, uh, he comes there, uh, he has um, seen the ideological justification of the German capitalist development after the World War I, and one couldn't really convince him that everything was okay in Turkey, even I'm sure that in the part he was living in Istanbul, uh, most of the things were okay, they were well, re well received. Uh, in Turkey as uh, not know-how transfers. But he was critiquing in his personal letters the capitalist development disguised as progress, Kalkınma, incorporated in the early Republic in uh, Kemalist Republic. And he was intrigued about the how and why of the language reform that, uh, and questioning they were discussing the, around the term of tradition and raising of the Ottoman language in 1928. Uh, so Awarbak was, um, translated very, very, at a very late point into Turkish. Uh, and that's another issue that should be covered, deception histories. So I would, in one page, uh, the materiality, the, the timing, the temporality of the reception of Benjamin is, is in 1960s and 70s, we have a vacuum. Uh, though there are dense translations of the other members of the Frankfurt School, and the system critical uh, authors, as everywhere it was the 1968 movement and the rise of the social movements, especially the workers' movement, slightly the feminist movement, but not at all the environmental movement. Uh, so the system critical authors uh, were widely translated and also Frankfurt School, uh, but Marcuse was the man uh, that was translated and read or referred to widely and he was forgetting. He was really opted out of this translation issue. I think the Turkish left was too progress optimistic to discover Benjamin and Devri. After the coup d'etat in 1980, we, uh, the translations don't find home in academia. There we have very strong journal cycles that hosted uh, exposed intellectuals. That's another conjunction that is comparable with today, with the mass uh, expulsion and oppression upon intellect intelligentsia in Turkey. I have named a couple of uh, journals which everybody here would know. I think those journals were also in our generation important for our intellectual formations, much more than the intellectual figures in academia we had at school. 
After 2000, there, this is the North Atlantic connection. Benjamin becomes a point of reference in the critical academia. That's the USA campus effect. That's also the time that more and more middle class, class people like we went to the Anglo-Saxon Saxon sphere and we started doing our PhDs. And this was this transfer was personal transfer was also important. Benjamin enters the academia mainly as a transatlantic discovery, but he was he was read along with Derrida, Agamben. Uh, Shishek, Berman, Eagleton, Jameson, Zontak, Levy, Batla, Harutunyan, and Susan Bach Morse. Uh, and it's important that he has entered not through the translations from German but from English. Most of the time, they, those were translations from English, or most of the translations what I found out are from English and from French. Uh, so, what happened after 2000? That we are more or less at the end period of the uh, the high tide of the 2000s, the zeitgeist of the period was conservative, liberal, and postmodern. Uh, in terms of uh, dominant citing of history, it was a neo-Ottomanist. Uh, there was a neo-Ottomanist. There was also conservative, liberal, and also and a postmodern critique of Kemalist frozen past. Uh, and the Kemalist frozen past was assumed to be concluded, which. Is in, un, which is not possible if one really reads Benjamin. No period in history is concluded, and uh, the history of n not a period, not even a single period, can be written once and for all. The thematic receptions were, are very important. The declared, there were thematic receptions in terms of state of emergency, which has popped out to be too uh, relevant and actual after 2016, but the thematic receptions were there after the declared state of exception, but those were local states of exception, emergency, sorry, in the Kurdish East, it was first local, which then became national after 2016, I would say. Another thematic reception was important um, by people who worked about the, like uh, I did, uh, what's relevant for uh, what I do most of the time, about the cutthroat city development and city destruction, for example, uh, certainly, and process since 2000, the mega projects, the urban regeneration projects, who have evacuated uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old uh, neighborhoods and who resolved the social capital and social ties who, 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 who were there. So it's a very accelerated process of urbanizing of capital. Another thematic reception was, um, which, is, which seems to be quite a luxury seen from perspective of the 2018, this is what I found out 2013, uh, where the priest process had recently started and uh, it was quite uh, liberal and it was possible to make films about the Darsin massacres, the Armenian genocide, there were conferences, first conferences held about naming the genocide as a genocide. Uh, it was the period of, this is also uh, the peace process and the facing of the past and uh, 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 period uh, and the politics of the memory uh, has made uh, has led several uh, intellectuals, academics uh, to to receive Benjamin's ideas um, about the debris, about the price uh, given and sold out for for what is called the development. But don't it was. And so that period was seen as concluded, the authoritarian period as being uh, concluded and we were heading towards more liberal and also in terms of rights periods. Uh, I, I'm going to skip quite, so that's, uh, if you want to know, so the Wakum Benjamin uh, is quite well recount by a group of people in, in the former Mülkiye in Ankara now who just try to put together everything that was done about Frankfurt School. You see in this the vacuum on Benjamin very well in this book of uh, Zaman and Tozo, edited by Kejan Noolo. Uh, the key concept really was important. The key concept of the reception of Frankfurt School was key framework was the anti-imperialism of the left. Uh, it's important, this, just a parenthesis, the, in the same uh, Marxist realist atmosphere in the epic theater, Benjamin entered through Brecht. He needed his friend Brecht, which is quite Turkish, we have never seen it in any other language, that his book on Brecht was the reason why he was known for so, to so many people, that I wanted to live this for you. This was in all the languages we did, tried to cover in our working group. This was people were really wondering about how come, you know, 
he's known about his uh, shifting über Brecht, and uh, people know, most of the people knew him, uh, people who read and knew him about the, as the biographer of Brecht, which, okay. Um, so, and there were also expertise translations, I left it out, some, uh, the work of art during the age of mechanical produ uh, production, some short articles gained uh, attention because of the rise of cultural industries and uh, I think in the background was the cognitive capitalism rising. So in 1980, coup d'etat uh, led to direct um, citations, reception of Benjamin about when he talked about fascism, outright fascism, well, what aestheticization means. I think we have still learned a lot from uh, from him. So Mussolowski was important. He wrote about the, so the subtitle of his work was uh, the aesthetized life on art, war, and politics. It was about not the German theories of fascism, but it was about the coup d'etat in Turkey. So we did a workshop here a couple of years ago, not here in Shihir University. It was, as far as I know, the first workshop dedicated to Benjamin. So it really came quite later after such fervent uh, translations. And I flipped out the books we really cited about. And there were eclectic sessions, I remember, about Benjamin and Passage, Benjamin and Aura, Kino, Ausname, Geschichte and Allegory, uh, trying to actualize Benjamin, also aesthetizing Benjamin. And I could see we didn't really enough discuss about the present day implications of Benjamin. I think we were, we were still inside the wave of now more of Benjamin and not uh, more of the actuality and more of the debris of Benjamin. So um, when, we, when I say debris, I mean that's the parts right upside. So very short uh, scheme I, I like to show when we talk about the Benjamin's the dialectics of seeing that he offers, that he tries to operationalize, uh, is a dream. We live in a dream, in a phantasmagoria. That's what capitalism and commodity fetish, fetishism creates. So we live with mythical history, and uh, this, is, this creates fetish. Uh, but uh, he invites us to awakening moments through which the messiah, messiah could pass. This is the historical nature. Uh, on the covering the debris and uh, functions by ways of allegories and also history of nature is important. Uh, but by, we know uh, this is how we function, that we have mythical histories and we create archives for our mythical histories and we create fetishes out of archives, that's the material. And also the mythical nature, in, especially we see it now everywhere, destroying the nature and the traces of nature, uh, brings back nature in forms of images of desire, uh, symbols of nature within the um, uh, landscape studies or landscape uh, within the gated communities, for example. So, like having planted three millions, millions, billions of trees. So, archives are used in uh, the archives uh, used in historicism or mythical history are archives like Benjamin calls them beads of a rosary. And tespih gibi bir araya getirilmiş tam Türkçesine. Okay, beads of rosary. Evet. Olaylar dizisini tesbih çeker gibi peş peşe sıralamaktan vazgeçecektir. Tesbih çeker gibi peş peşe sıralanmış e, bir zincir. E, events like the beads of a rosary. E, this is what the historicist constructs. E, he just puts the figure of the historical materialist instead and his own creation of archives by the of opposing fragments uh, uh, and uh, creating uh, dialectic im Stillstand, dialectics at a still point, is he grasped that he, historical materials can should grasp the constellation into which his own area has entered, along with a very specific earlier one. I think this is what we were discussing in the panel before. This is why we need to read filmic sources along with other Methods. I mean, with histor uh, oral uh, history, with uh, textual or archival history, uh, anything that is good for our uh, actualization of history and uh, historicizing of the actual uh, situation is okay. I think uh, that's uh, what what he calls a constellation. In order to produce this constellation, this permanent dialogue between today's problems and yesterday's accumulation and wealth and debris uh, is important. Um, so, 
the historical materialist establishes the conception of the present as now time shot through with splinters of messianic time. That's why through the politics of struggling and remembering, remembering why of struggling, there is another wave that uh, promises that were not resolved in the past could enter through the open time and can help out the people who try to solve the tradition. So this was part of the ICSN and we did, uh, I, I wish also we had the, those two colleagues, colleagues that would be here with us uh, who did the, the exhibition uh, three, two years ago, uh, it was a joint exhibition, I, would, I always call it Benjamin in Istanbul, uh, pat curated by uh, Patricia Bach, and uh, we, this was one of the, this is where he wrote about this historicism uh, article, there were parts of the uh, Barta Benjamin archive were sent to Istanbul. So, uh, and I'm going to finish with showing you some uh, counter examples because of beads of rosary, how beads of rosary are put under the con conditions of neo-Ottomanism and it's not about history writing only, it's quite, uh, I, I, I want to share with some shared pictures that we see in the street scrapes in the shared city that we have in the synchronicity of the lived experience, I want to see how uh, aestheticizing, aestheticizing and historicizing, uh, historicizing uh, the roles of so beads of rosary are constituted in order to uh, give a linear perception of that the capitalist accumulation is going on and the state formation is going on forever. So, um, for the, the one example is, for example, uh, what sparked the Gezi Park movement was certainly that was the Taksim artillery wanted to be rebuilt as a shopping mall. Uh, or old neighborhoods, uh, really living organisms are raised, are on top of them Ottoman and Selçuki neighborhoods who are named also after these, are uh, made on top of them and this is called, this, really uh, called this Ottomanist gentrification. Or, I mean, one of the uh, very saying example is the dysfunctionalization of the 600 years. If really history is about being old, we are about to destroy 600 years old. Ottoman shipyards in Halic and uh, privatizing into hotel chains uh, with boutique hotels, but a museum about shipping history in Turkey. Uh, so I'm asking myself whether this period of construction, the archives is kind of a geleceğin her türlü ayak işleri itinayla yapılır, which means is historicism and the type of archive is constructs the bellboy of, a, of vision as we we, we, we see it, every, we hear it every day from all angles. Like our universities have visions, the ministries have visions, so we have to be visionary and carriers have visions. So is historicism one, uh, rose, uh, one bead in the rosary who's the bellboy of the vision? So that vision uh, is a continuum, it's a linear success story, it's a mythical narrative of state formation and a mythical narrative of capital accumulation who is always there, who will always be there. This is the subliminal message that is given to us if we still try to uh, use the archives in order to uh, enhance this continuum. So, um, is this the archive fever about this? So, uh, and I'm going to uh, finish with these fragments. I'm going to just show you the mythological history, the objects of Ottomania. This is one of the top examples I could ever encounter. That's the Armai Osmani. It was an innovation of 1882-3, and it was renewed in 1922. It's like initiated Marsha, so it's a totally uh, uh, late Ottoman innovation. So, and it's a two-dimensional innovation, which has been transformed into a monument in uh, Bilecik. Uh, it has been so. It's a it's a monument that exists in the middle as an urban furniture in the middle of a city, uh, and which refers to an older existing Ottoman past. And this is the uh, Ottoman uh, artillery that wanted to be so uh, taken out of the history by a tiger leap of the dominant tiger leap of the power, certainly. Uh, why these artillery barracks would, uh, wanted to be reconstructed in order to put a shopping mall inside them because it was a, uh, it has hosted an Islamist upsurge. Uh, uh, and then when there was the Gezi movement uh, where we were, uh, other 
parts of the history of the Gezi Park and surroundings were remembered, like the Armenian cemetery on top of which this part of the park was built, or the heroin factory in the buildings of Tashkışlı today, another barrack together. It was a state and private capital joint uh, um, investment that produced heroin for the whole market, and it was part of the progress. So, and we have uh, now this private partner public shifts that forms our lives. So these were the uh, first uh, signs how the progress is leading us to. Oh, this is the Historia shopping mall on the historical peninsula. Uh, no other uh, formation could tell you better what the phantasmagoria of capital is. What kind of archives, what kind of leap, uh, title leaps do we need in order to talk about a shopping mall? In a historical, in, in the most historical part of Istanbul, or this is this is the the counterpart of the mythical uh, history is uh, the the nature, the the the, the fetishized nature, and that's in Bosphorus city, one of the leading uh, urban projects. It's on top of the garbage collection center of the European Center. That's the garbage collection. Halka the top top topluma bölgesiydi. And uh, Bosphorus, if you, so this is done, uh, the, some of the houses of, uh, of, on the Bosphorus are reproduced as a second nature on top of the garbage collection center, and this is sold as a city. That's, the, that's also the relationship to history. Has, uh, uh, to, we can also question our relationship to the nature, and also talk about uh, uh, archiving the nature in terms of these very uh, accelerated uh, times of uh, destruction of nature. And all, another you see below uh, the, the, the Mahalle, the thousand year Roman uh, neighborhood of Sulukule that has been erased to make an Ottoman neighborhood out of this. And this is what popped up and it hasn't been sold to the audience that it wanted to sell with the mythical nature as a commodity. Uh, but uh, it was then used uh, by uh, middle class Syrian uh, refugees who fled the war in other destructions. So I think the open questions are, how are archives constructed? How are their relationships to the mythical past and the necessity of having a mythical past in the current uh, period of authoritarian liberalism? And what counts as in archives? Who are the actors of establishing archives? And how are they used and cited from? And if we, so remembering that uh, the tiger leaps into the Ottoman past, this archive fever, this archive for the, uh, this fever for the star uh, historian that has popped up in the last 20 years. What kind of tiger leaps do we have? And uh, how are the archives used in order to make the tiger leaps of this mythical history? And, um, and what is the relationship of forgetting and remembering and revolt? So Nisyan and Nisyan, what makes you remember? What makes you remember? things that were, all the promises that were not resolved in the past. And I would uh, argue uh, that the Turkey's now time is really um, in Temo, in witnessing, Turkey's now time is really witnessing very vivid civil initiatives of documenting the debris of development. Everywhere another civil initiative pops up uh, documenting the workplace murders, feminicides, the urban urbanicides, desaparecidos, right violations of all sorts and migrant deaths, and document the debris. I'm gonna. I, I'm wondering whether those civil initiatives will count as archives one day, or will they count as counterparts of archives? Thank you very much for listening. To me. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, uh, but I have bad news for you, you're getting late, you know, yeah, okay, uh, so you're gonna leave, I guess, okay, okay. So our next speaker is Asman Sunar, uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with her work, you already know her, but, you know, as a chair, it's my obligation to give a short summary about her research area. Uh, she studies sociology at Middle Eastern Technical University. This is something that I really wanted to emphasize because I'm also a graduate from there. <laughs> so
So, and then she received her PhD in the Department of Communications at Massachusetts University. For several years, she taught in the Comparative Literature Department at Hong Kong University. And she's currently teaching at Istanbul Technical University and Sabancı University. She's published many articles in several journals, such as Cinema Journal, Defter, New Perspectives on Turkey, Screen, Social Identities, Sight and Sound, and Toplum Mebidem. Apart from these articles, she published a book entitled Hayalete, Yeni Türk Sinemasında Aidiyet, Kimlik ve Bellek. I think it was published in 2006, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. uh, also, this book was published in English under the title New Turkey Cinema, Belonging Identity Memory. So, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I will take up from uh, actually what uh, Asl called uh, cutthroat city development, that context uh, in which we can uh, relate to Benjamin's uh, work, one context uh, which enables us to, to think of Benjamin. Uh, but before uh, the talk, let me begin with a personal note. Uh, actually, uh, I, I have no, I have very little knowledge on this research on archives. Uh, the presentation is not going to be about archives, uh, and it is not directly about Benjamin, so it's uh, basically some indirect uh, references to those subjects. Uh, so, I'm a latecomer to this conference in the sense that I got to know about the conference on a couple of weeks ago, speaking uh, with uh, Professor Erdogan over the phone. I was talking about my upcoming book, uh, and we figured that maybe some themes in the book might be relevant in the context of this conference. The book is entitled Hong Kong Istanbul, a comparative study of the recent development of the two cities in during the last 30 years or so. Comparative study of Hong Kong and Istanbul, these two cities at the two ends of Asia. Um, one of the, obviously one of the issues that I deal with in the book is this uh, rigorous process of urban transformation in both cities. And in this context, one, uh, one scholar uh, that I draw upon is Akbar Abbas. Uh, you may know him, he's a leading cultural theorist uh, who also obviously written a great deal about Hong Kong as well. Uh, so I use his concept uh, in the book, this, the concept of culture of disappearance, the concept that he developed in the context of Hong Kong. Uh, a con concept that he developed by drawing upon the work of Walter Benjamin and a concept that I think what, is closely related to Istanbul, the context of Istanbul. So this is going to be the overall uh, framework of the presentation. Uh, so my starting point in the presentation is this recent fascination with archives, photographic archives. Uh, that depict the um, Republican history of Istanbul. Uh, I think we can observe, you know, something like, a, you know, some, some kind of fascination with those old photographs depicting the city, Istanbul, in 1940s, 50s, 60s. So how to make sense of this fascination? This is my starting point. So let me begin with two photographic archives that re recently received uh, considerable critical attention. They belong to two professional photographers who were born in the first quarter of the 20th century. They both lived in Istanbul at Beyoğlu district that we are having this conference. Uh, they both from Armenian origin. One of them is a studio photographer, the other is a photojournalist. One of them was a completely private person who was not publicly recognized. 
the other was an international celebrity. A woman and a man, Maryam Shahinyan and Ara Güler. So I would like to draw upon uh, the kind of fascination that their work uh, received in recent years. Okay, I'm not a very technologically literate person, obviously. Okay. So Maryam Shahinyan. Uh, she's the first female studio photographer of Turkey. Uh, we actually we got to know about her quite uh, recently. Uh, and uh, okay. Okay, let me turn to Maryam Shahinyan. First female studio photographer of Turkey. Uh, she took over her father's business uh, and she ran her studio, Foto Galata Sarai, all by herself from 1937 to 1985. Okay. Mariam Shahinyan, once again. Okay, Mariam Shahinyan is a very young woman in her 20s, probably. Uh, Again, first female studio photographer of Turkey. She ran Photo Galata Sarai for almost 60 years, all by herself. Uh, when she retired in 1985, she left behind an enormous archive made up of approximately 200,000 images. The project of the recovery of her archive was taken over by a cultural foundation owned by a private bank. After a two-year painstaking process of cleaning, sorting, <coughs> digitalizing the negatives, the archive was opened to public in 2011. This summer, in the summer of 2018, uh, Typhoon Sertash, the artist researcher who recovered the archive, he opened his own installation exhibition by using a selection of Mariam Shahinyan photographs. Uh, th this exhibition was, uh, the exhibition was entitled uh, Flash Flag. It took place in Plevneli Gallery at Dolaptere. So this is the, the first picture depicts the gallery. It's actually a very fancy, uh, very innovative building in the middle of Dolaptere. I will talk about this neighborhood uh, in a minute. Uh, and some images from the exhibition. Uh, selection of photographs by Mariam Shahin. Ara Güler, um, nicknamed the Eye of Istanbul, Ara Güler was an internationally acclaimed photojournalist whose work included a large array of photographs ranging from international celebrity portraits to land landscape photos. Yet, his trademark shots were the black and white images of Istanbul during the 50s and 60s, or ranging from 40s to 60s. Having been the first Near East correspondent for Time Life magazine, his photographs were also presenting an image of Istanbul for Western audiences. So he was one of those first photographers from Turkey whose images were presenting Istanbul for Western audiences. On his 19th birthday in August 2018, a museum devoted to his legacy was opened in Istanbul, and he actually passed away shortly after the opening of the museum. <coughs> Located at Womandiada in Shishli, uh, this is the location where the museum is opened, a regular museum also houses a vast archive that contains, that contains nearly one million negatives produced by Aragula. Uh, so actually, uh, on the one hand, these two figures, Mariam Shahinyan and Aragula, they are very similar, belong to more or less the same generation, both from Armenian origin, uh, but they are com completely different figures in certain respects. Uh, for one thing, uh, while Mariam Shahinian's archive was discovered and brought to public knowledge completely by chance, she was 
and she was not a well-known public figure at all before her archive was discovered, again by chance. Um, Aragüler's archive was somewhat like, it was hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight in the sense that Aragüler was a well-known figure, he was a celebrity, everyone knew about him. Uh, but it was somewhat like his legacy overshadowed his work. Uh, so the significance of his work uh, was recently discovered. It was being discovered, maybe, uh, gradually. Uh, again, his legacy somehow uh, made that his work was mostly uh, neglected. The nature of his work was mostly neglected. Um, okay, so also uh, Mariam Shahinian, another key difference between the two figures, Mariam Shahinian was a very private person. Uh, he only gave two photographs, or a handful of photographs, we don't have images of her, other than you know, a couple of uh, photographs uh, that uh, she was taken for passports. Uh, whereas, again, Aragüner was a complete celebrity. His images were everywhere. Uh, okay, so uh, it is interesting to think about these two figures together because of the similarities and the differences between the two. Uh, so before talking about the nature of their work, uh, I would like to actually um, talk about very briefly about the places where they are, uh, actually they, they, they were recently appeared, those two districts, Dolapdere and uh, Bomonti. Uh, Dolapdere and Bomonti, they both, they have been historical neighborhoods at the center of the city with a significant concentration of non-Muslim communities, mainly the Armenian community in the past. Uh, Dolapdere is a low-income district at the vicinity of Be Beolu. Uh, it has been going through a rigorous process of transformation during the last couple of years. Uh, the transformation of Dolapdere could be described as uh, gentrification through arts, because this process was mainly triggered, initiated by a series of art institutions backed by major capital in Istanbul uh, moving into the district. Uh, so uh, after uh, this gradual transformation of the district by, uh, by those art institutions, uh, some real estate companies they also initiated major projects at Dolapdere, which transformed the nature of the state, uh, district considerably. So Plevia the gallery was among the first galleries, one of the pioneer galleries moving into the district, discovering the potential of the district, potential for gentrification. Uh, Bomontiada is another very interesting location uh, in Istanbul, in, it's, it's uh, interesting because it's symptomatic in terms of uh, transformation of the city through arts, once again. Um, so this Bomonte itself, uh, it was an actually a historical industrial zone, this where the museum takes place, Bomonte Ada. It was a, a historical industrial zone, an old beer factory, which have been transformed into a recreational place during the last decade. Uh, it's composed of art galleries, per performance centers, stylish bars and restaurants. The director of the project, Project of Bomonteada, it defines their vision as culture as real estate investment. So these two uh, concepts actually are quite in interesting in the context of uh, Dolapdere, gentrification through arts, uh, in the context of Bomontea, the culture as real, invest, uh, real estate investment. So, it is how to make my starting point. 
uh, in this presentation, again, not a formal presentation, but just a series of questions maybe, how to make sense of this juxtaposition, right? those fascination with archives on the one hand, and uh, the appearance of those archives in the spaces of disappearance. So this interesting juxtaposition. But before talking about that uh, relationship between the urban space and those archives, let me uh, give you an indication about the works of those artists. Uh, at first sight, the works of Mariam Shahinian and Ara Güler, they articulate completely different forms, different aesthetics. Mariam Shahinian's work is strictly confined to interiors. Obviously, she was a studio photographer. So uh, her works, her work took place inside the space of her studio. Aragüler, on the other hand, he mostly worked on the streets of the city. He worked on in public spaces. Mariam Shahinian's photographs are characterized by a sense of stasis and repetition. Similar mise-en-scene and poses appear again and again in her photographs. Aragüler's photographs, on the other hand, are marked by a sense of movement and spontaneity. Apart from ordinary passport photographs, Shahinian's archive include photographs of men and women, couple of families, often posing for special occasions. Occasions like weddings, different sorts of religious ceremonies, anniversaries, commemorations, etc. Given Shahinian's Armenian origins, uh, we can expect that many of the people in the photographs were members of non-Muslim communities, Armenian community. Also, people in the photographs are from middle class origin. We can make that assumption. So just to give you an indication about her photographs, very, you know, this kind of, this mise-en-scene is repeated over and over again. Photographs depicting couples family photographs, obviously, celebrations of some portraits of individual men and women. Uh, so in spite of the sense of repetition that Shahinian's archive inevitably generates, sense of repetition because you see the same mise over and over and over again, she used the same techniques same camera angles, same style over the years, over the decades. So despite the sense of repetition characterizing her archive, there are certain images that catch the audience by surprise. And in the recent uh, exhibition, Typhoon Sertash, uh, the artist, uh, actually underlined that surprise element in the photographs by uh, giving us larger images of the, those photographs that I will talk about. Those photographs that surprise the audience most are the images that defy the conventional norms of society. Photographs, images that depict same-sex couples. Photographs that depict cross-dressed men. So just, uh, okay. This is actually, this gives you an indication about the repetition that I am talking about. Same style, same mise-en-scene. Uh, again, Typhoon Sertash in his exhibition, he underlines this monotonous, uniform element in the photographs uh, by giving us the same size photographs multiplied through walls of the exhibition hall. Yet, some photographs were singled out. Photographs like this. Photographs again defying the established norms of society. Photographs depicting those same-sex lovers posing for Shahinian's camera. Photographs of cross-dressed men posing for Shahinian's photo uh, camera. Those intimate, actually, moments of those people always who defy the existing norms of society. So this was the most astonishing, eye-catching, fascinating aspect of 
Şahiniyan, e, Tayfun Sertbaş Exhibition, Tayfun Sertbaş Exhibition of Şahiniyan Photos. Okay, uh, so, Aragüler, uh, Aragüler's photographs, they are completely different. Okay. Uh, he captures images of ordinary people uh, from everyday life of Istanbul. Uh, people are people he photographed are always, almost always laborers, people from lower class origin, and residing in poor neighborhoods of Istanbul. Uh, his photographs also entail. Uh, his photographs also reveal how everyday life in Istanbul has been shaped around the remnants of different historical periods. The long lost past of the imperial city is part of the everyday life of Istanbul. It's another key aspect of his photographs. Okay, let me leave you with this most well known uh, image by Aragüler. So, okay, so how to make sense of, again, this juxtaposition between urban transformation of the city, gentrification on the one hand, and fascination with those archival material. Uh, so let me introduce this concept of culture of disappearance and uh, I, I won't have enough time to complete the presentation. I, I will stop that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Akbar Abbas suggests that migrancy should be understood not only as changing places but also as the changing nature of places. Migrancy can take an extensive and intensive form. In the latter case, we can be migrants without going anywhere. In other words, in a situation when the nature of the space surrounding us is radically transformed, we might find ourselves alien in the environment where we inhabit as though we have migrated to somewhere else. So the second form of migration takes place in a culture of disappearance. Here, disappearance does not mean vanishing without a trace. It does not simply refer to absence, but it connotes some kind of problematic presence. It connotes a ghostly presence. So the city of disappearance, uh, I'm sorry, so the city disappears not because we do not see it, but it disappears because we do not know what we are seeing any longer. So we can suggest that Istanbul has been recently experiencing both forms of migrancy, extensive and intensive. Migrancy as changing places and migrancy as the changing nature of the place. Speaking as migrancy as changing places, we can talk about a change in the demographic makeup of the city, uh, which is uh, felt most strikingly in, in the Beyoğlu district. Uh, during the last decade, uh, Turkey received a massive wave of migration from, from the Middle East countries, Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so there is a significant wave of migration uh, towards Turkey during this period. At the same time, there is a significant wave of migration uh, out of Turkey as well. Many, many middle class professionals have left the country uh, because of the um, political developments of the recent years, because of the oppressive atmosphere, political atmosphere in the country. So in that sense, we can talk about migrancy uh, in this very uh, concrete form. On the other hand, what is more interesting, migrancy is changing nature of places, maybe. Uh, so anyone who walks around Beyoğlu district today would easily testify the drastic change in the texture of the urban space. Many people sense that urban space and urban culture has increasingly become unrecognizable during this period, as though it has been going through some kind of strange metamorphosis. So it's like 
we do not migrate to anywhere, but the place that we are inhabiting is migrating. So we do not know what the, we do not know what we are seeing anymore. Something like that. Um, so according to Akbar Abbas, this motive of disappearance in the context of the modern city, uh, obviously he explains it in relation to Baudelaire, Benjamin, 19th century Paris. Let me skip this part. So uh, in the case of the uh, disappearing city, he says, it may not be possible to provide any direct or immediate images of disappearance. So you are in, you endure this experience of disappearance. You sense it all the time, but it is impossible to capture. It is impossible to explain. Uh, so uh, disappearance appears as in the form of an afterimage. It appears in the form of a visual sensation that occurs after a visual sensation that occurs after stimulation by its external cause has ceased. So it is like this lasting mental image. So I would suggest that the recent fascination with the images of Istanbul and the photographs of Maryam Shahinyan and Arabilar, it is closely related with the current experience of disappearance in the city. The ghostly image of Istanbul appears in those photographs, turns into an after image, which makes it possible to have an elusive grasp of our present moment of disappearance. Images of old Istanbul that we find in those photographs, that we find in those archives, fascinates us because they make the emerging culture of disappearance quite tangible for us. When we look at those images, what we see is not simply the past, but also the present. These images make our experience of disappearance palpable in the sense that they reveal Istanbul is has always already been a space of disappearances. So they make us, they open up this space of disappearance in front of us, which again uh, help us to make sense of our present moment. So let me stop here. Uh, um, I was wondering, looking at this photograph, for instance, which you say is made somewhere between the 40s and the 60s, and you call it an afterimage because the place has changed. Uh, you did not really say when that change took place, so, but you don't have to specify it now, but my question would be, because photographs, say, Ajev, for instance, in the late 19th century or the 20th century, mean the place looks different too. So what are the conditions then to call something migrancy as in the sense of a change of place? So what, what distinguishes, for instance, this photograph of Istanbul from a Najef photograph of 1900 in Paris? Okay, thank, thank you very much for this question. I skipped uh, some large chunks of the presentation because of time pressure. I understand. Okay, uh, so for the first of all, when this uh, change took place, Okay, so uh, actually uh, the, the first uh, observation is that uh, there is the sense of, uh, in a sense, a uh, sense of rupture that uh, many people are experiencing in Istanbul in, during the last couple of years or so because of the traumatic events of the last couple of years. Uh, maybe the starting point might, might be this Gizzi Park movement that Aslan also mentioned, 2013. Uh, and after that point, actually, we can talk about uh, the gradual increase in the authoritarian policies of the government, which have been most effective in Istanbul, in Beylu district at Istanbul, because it is the most well-known public, actually, place, Istanbul and Turkey. 
Uh, so there is this perception that public space is n narrowing down gradually, and particularly after the 2016 coup attempt. Uh, it was a very dramatic moment. Uh, actually, there was this sense that everything is changing. We are inhabiting, what we are inhabiting is an alien space. We don't know, you know this space any longer. So it's a very drastic, actually, perception. Uh, it's a perception of a very drastic change. Um, so I, I, what, what I was trying to suggest is something like that. Those photographs of all the stumble, they enable us to make sense of this change. In a sense, they enable us to make sense of this you know, the, the pattern of change that we are having. And also, uh, they make us understand that, well, uh, disappearance is not a new phenomenon at all in the history of Istanbul. Disappearance is not a new phenomenon in the history of modern city. Right? This is what Benjamin shows us. This is what Baudelaire shows us. Disappearance is actually the norm for the modern city. Uh, and disappearance is actually not a new phenomenon at all in, in the history of Istanbul. Uh, so in a sense, uh, this is what I suggest that those images are like after images because uh, for us they do not, or uh, you can read those images in this way, they do not necessarily belong to the past, but they also belong to the present. So they ask, they are actually like offering a, a kind of, you know, multiple times at once when you look at those images you can perceive Istanbul through a series of disappearances that it has gone through. Uh, so again, uh, if we return to Mariam Shahinian's images, for example, uh, obviously the type of Istanbul in those images, cosmopolitan, um, a more cosmopolitan city, uh, a city where uh, non-Muslim populations, non-Muslim communities, uh, you know, uh, were more populous. Uh, so it, 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 it has not disappeared recently. It has it disappeared, you know, uh, before, nine, uh, before the 50s. So in that sense, those images help us to think of, you know, the recent disappearance that we are living through, through multiple... Sure, sure, but Anna, I think those two photographers are important, uh, particularly for Aragulaj. Uh, many people think that he is a very, dis you know, distinctive photographer. His his eye is quite, uh, you know, keen. He produced quite, you know, powerful images of Istanbul, uh, but obviously, yeah. Holds true for other photographs. And this is again to you, but I think it's trying to find a way of connecting with the theme of Benjamin. Um, you said that both of these photographers have been uh, celebrated by the opening of exhibitions of their work. Uh, and I'm wondering about this phenomenon, which is something that we're experiencing not just in Istanbul, but it's, I think, a global phenomenon of seeing old photographs presented in a very sophisticated, modern, stripped-down, elegant way. I, mean, I can make a comparison, for instance, with another very different city. Uh, well, in London, this happens a great deal, where I live, but also in, in Derry, in Ireland, there's been a, a lot of memorialization of Derry as it was at the time of the uh, civil strife in the 1960s through very elegant uh, exhibitions of old photographs, which of course make you think about that time and what separates that time from this time. I'm trying to think about what this has to do with Benjamin. I'm thinking about one particular section of Benjamin, which is his discussion of the Kaiser Panorama and the way in which 
photographs are presented in a strange way, which is both old and new, as he remembers the experience of it. Yeah. Not an exact parallel, but you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's old photographs being shown in a new way. Mm -hmm. And so they acquire a new kind of sense of um, presence in our, for us. But what they actually represent is, of course, the past. Mm -hmm. And they make us think about not just the temporal, as you say, the political space, but also the technological difference between then mm -hmm. and now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense to you? Very much so. Maybe, uh, you know, something, an additional point. Uh, in the case of Mariam Shahinyan's, those images that defy the conventional norms of society, uh, again, it is not only Shahinyan, but actually, when you uh, consider those, you know, museum exhibitions of the last couple of years, we had several exhibitions presenting photographs of old Istanbul like the way you talk about. Exactly, the way that the old and the new are presented in those uh, exhibitions. And there is a certain aesthetization, of, of, obviously, commodification of uh, the past uh, as part of that exhibition. Uh, so there is a fascination with all those exhibitions. Today I focus on these two photographers because they are prominent figures. But there are many uh, photographers that you know whose names are not known to the public. I don't know their names, but their images are everywhere. So maybe what is uh, you know specific to Turkish context or is specific to the recent history of Turkey? In those photographs, we can talk about something like nostalgia for the modern. This is a concept actually developed by uh, Esra Özyürek, uh, the anthropologist. Uh, 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 anthropologist from Turkey. So nostalgia for the modern in the sense that there is this sense of grieving that uh, we are losing modernity in our present moment in Turkey because of the increasing conservative, cultural conservatism, authoritarianism that we are going through. Uh, so this uh, nostalgia for the modern, modern is something, the image of modern is something to be captured in the past. But uh, I totally agree, it is a totally commodified, aestheticized image, definitely so. And this is why I try to problematize that those images appear precisely at spaces of disappearance. So, Dolap Deren Bomonteada, these are extremely commodified spaces and these images are part of this aesthetization, commodification of urban culture. But still, I argue that those images themselves retain a certain power, retain a certain power of you know, helping us, making sense of this experience of disappearance. This is why I said that they make that they do not explain this experience, right? No, not that. They make it tangible. They make us feel, you know, what it is. And starting from those images, yes, they articulate into this co culture of commodification, but they may articulate into different critical spaces as well. So starting from those images, we can produce, you know, different things in terms of what to make of this experience. This is. What I was trying to say, actually, so it's because of the rush, I focused on these two photographers, but no, I mean, it holds true for other images as well. <coughs> I was remembered that the uh, pioneers of photography, like Elon Leopold, he was commissioned to photograph the bridges that was built by landlord, by the, by the uh, train baron of uh, America, the transnational train uh, system. So he, on the one hand side, he photographed the industrial revolution, which at the same time destroyed the landscape. And then at the same time, he photographed the telescope. So the desire of the romantic view of what the industry destroys happens at the same time. The moment the destruction starts, the desire to forcibly have to 
keep the nature or whatever we destroy arises. And this is to be seen from other times of photography. Very true, but still, again, those photographs, this does not prevent those photographs retaining a certain power. This is the critical potential, the creative potential as well.